hello and welcome to my show, which I'm not going to name right now because there's already going to be a title card and, well, I don't feel like saying it twice. My name is Willie Muse, joined as usual by my co-host, Nicholas. And this week, I'm back on my grind. I took a little break from doing my normal top model videos last time because I had another thing that I wanted to do and I kind of felt like I needed a break from top model because truth be told, doing this show is, is kind of starting to wear on me a little bit. And yes, I know I've only done three episodes, but each episode I do, it, it gets a little bit harder. Well, actually, if I'm being honest, each episode I do, I get a little more comfortable with the process of making videos and stuff, so it actually gets a little bit easier. But then, because it gets easier, it gets less interesting to do, and so then it ends up being harder. I, I know that doesn't make sense. I, I don't understand how my brain works either. Don't get me wrong, I've loved putting these videos out, and you guys have been so nice with your response to them. And Truth told, if, if I were being honest, I'd probably say that making them was the one bright spot in an otherwise total ass ache of a year, but with all that said, still... <sighs> For the longest time, I told myself that I was going to do this series, and the idea of doing it was always really exciting to me, and eventually it became exciting enough that it actually inspired me to get up off my ass and and make the damn thing and well pretty much the instant that I did that the, the excitement it, it, it started to dim truth told it doesn't help that the episode of top model I'm about to talk about is kind of a forgettable one like it has its moments to be sure but as a whole it's kind of filler compared to some of the better episodes of the season I'm going to power through because well, I need to learn how to finish the things that I start, and I'm sure once I do that, the spark will come back eventually, but as for now, it's kind of feeling like a bit of a slog to make these videos. I guess I don't know because I haven't made it yet, but with that in mind, there's a solid chance that this episode I'm making right now is... it, it might suck. That, that's probably not the best way to start a video, is it? Hello, nitwits, and welcome to Knitting Time with Willie. I'm Willie, joined as always by my lovely co-host, Nicholas. And together, we're inviting you to come join us on the newest episode of my wonderful, unimpeachable, absolutely perfect deep dive into the weird and wonderful world of America's Next Top Model, Cycle 6. Today, we're doing Cycle 6, Episode 3, The Girl Who Kissed the Roach, and boy oh boy, is it going to be a good one. I mentioned before that Danielle is probably my favorite winner to come out of the show, but I feel like I haven't really brought her up much in my videos yet, and I think that's because, well... She hasn't really done that much on the show yet, but thankfully, all that changes in this episode. Actually, no, I take that back. Given how things play out for her, thankfully sounds like kind of a mean word to use there because like I've mentioned before, Danielle's storyline is kind of just that she puts up with a lot of bad shit happening to her without complaining so that she can win the competition. And this week is when all the bad shit starts to happen to her so it's not a good thing but but at least she gets more screen time before this episode is up she will suffer an injury that will require medical attention but before that happens she has another difficult challenge she's forced to endure and and not complain about and and that is dealing with her fellow contestant gina Disgusting! Everyone, we're living like pigs. The episode opens with Gina and Danielle commiserating over cleaning the kitchen in the top model house because, like I said in an earlier episode, the contestants are basically living in their own filth by the end of the season. Like, I know that they may put the girls up in a Hollywood mansion, but I think that the producers of this show might still 
technically qualify as slumlords. Gina is very clearly not happy to be living in her own filth and Danielle very calmly talks her through it in a way that kind of feels like her thesis statement as a character on the show. I can't let them get under your skin though. I mean, I don't know what you've been through in your life, but not much until you've been through like some hard knocks, it toughens your skin. Honestly, this entire scene is kind of masterful as an example of character building. As an aspiring screenwriter myself, whose works have been described by my peers as I'll try to read it if I ever get the chance, I can say with good authority that what happens in this opening scene is is really well done. Like, really well done. Like, it would honestly be almost too on the nose were it written out in a script instead of being spoken aloud by by real people in a in a reality show. I mean, I've been through a lot of hell in my life. I guess I've always been naive. I always kind of trusted people, you know? Don't change who you are, but just, you know, watch out. Gina is a naive young girl who hasn't experienced much in life, and Danielle is the wise beyond her years sage who has been through more than someone twice her age and now their paths have crossed and an unlikely friendship has formed. Danielle is a really good person helping me and trying to comfort me. She's someone who is just, just really strong. Uh, unfortunately for Danielle, I, I don't know how much she actually wants to be in that unlikely friendship so much as Gina kind of just imprinted on her and and, and Danielle is, is too nice to say anything about it. I don't mind her coming to me for advice, but you know, Danielle needs her space too. And in Gina's defense, I get it because Danielle does genuinely come across like the coolest person alive and I would want to be her friend too, but it does seem like maybe Gina could have played it a little bit cooler than she does. I'm gonna follow you. Gina, you make me I'm nervous. gonna follow you after you're done. You're waiting to take a shower? Yep. Can I watch you? Go shower? No, you don't watch me take showers. Rewatching these scenes, it does kind of seem like it might be the case that Gina is actively trying to annoy Danielle in a playful sort of way, and the editors just kind of made it look like she was acting like a bit of a stalker because that's more interesting, but then again, given Danielle's reaction to the situation, I honestly can't tell what's the case. Dang, I ain't asked you to come move in my bed with me. You know, I'll still give you advice every now and then, but don't like be all up in my zone. Next up, the girls are treated to a lesson on walking the runway from Miss J, and it's stuff like this that I think are what makes the show work as well as it does, because everything that happens on Top Model is stupid and and vapid and just an all-around dumpster fire, but at its core, there's still a genuine craft being taught by what seem like some of the foremost experts in the world. Like, I would have never thought of runway expert as something that someone could be because honestly, it doesn't seem like there's that much to walking on a runway, but Ms. J is so smart and incisive about the critiques that he gives that you walk away from it thinking that like, yes, he deserves his job and maybe he's a genius. You need to be able to slinky ink down the runway. If you can't slinky ink, you may look stinky stink. Uh, okay, maybe not there per se, but he is really good at picking up on small little things that a lay person like myself would have never noticed in a million years. And it's genuinely fascinating to watch. Miranda, attitude strong, strong, strong. Is your left arm attached to your body? Okay. You take short little stompy steps that make you walk heavy. My favorite example of this is his critique of Leslie because like, it's truly eye-opening. Leslie. Girl. <laughs> Ooh, child. Like, on my own, I would have looked at her and been like, she walks like a person, I guess. But after a two second critique, I can't not see what Miss J is talking about. And for the rest of the season, watching her walk is kind of hilarious in an I'm going to hell sort of way. I need you to shape your body, not like this, like this. Girl. <laughs> Ciao. After their initial critiques, Miss J has them put on these ball gowns that the show just has lying around for some reason to up the stakes a little bit. And it honestly feels kind of unfair to me. Like, it feels like some of them would probably be a lot harder to walk in than others. 
Although that said, I guess my walking and ball gown experience is pretty limited, so I, I probably can't be a good judge on this one. Danielle's dress in particular seems to be a huge disadvantage. Like it's beautiful, but it also seems like it was purposefully designed to trip whoever's wearing it. Like honestly, if I found out that it was designed by some evil rich person designer for the express purpose of killing your wife at a cocktail party and making it look like an accident so you could run off with your mistress, I'd be like, yeah, that, that makes sense. Not surprisingly, she trips in it, and it's again a level of foreshadowing for what happens in the episode that, that would feel a little bit on the nose if it were written out in a script. I'm, I'm starting to wonder if, if maybe, maybe this show is scripted. I don't think it is, though. I think the editors are just evil geniuses. After their lesson, the girls get a Tyra mail that just has a weird word in Latin on it. It says two words, Gromfadorina Tosa. And the girls try to guess what it means, which is pretty fun to watch because they are all terrible guessers. Oh my god, it's Spain. Portentosa. Portly. Fat hats. <laughs> Jade types it into this little translator thing that she brought with her from home for some reason. And of course the translator does not give the right answer. Yeah. <laughs> okay, what's the word? I got it. It basically means like, um, what does it mean? Gravy trains! <laughs> Gravy trains. Obviously that's not what it means. and. That's kind of unfortunate because I would very much like to see the challenge the show would do where the, where the clue is just the words gravy train in Latin. F feels like it would probably be more interesting than, than what we get here. In reality, the Tyra male was hinting at their next challenge, which surprise is that the girls will be walking in a fashion show for for a designer named Jared Gold. You're going to be walking in my spring collection, which is called Glinka. And when I say fashion show there, know that I'm using the term very loosely. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the concept of a morp, but, but the entire fashion show kind of feels like a morp to me. Like just a small group of weirdos who gathered in a windowless room to judge other people and, and act like they're cooler than everyone else. The show doesn't even try to pretend that this is a real event because the crowd is literally just five fashion people who look like they would be mean to me and, and, and a bunch of empty seats. And like even the fashion people don't sit in the front row for some reason. They don't seem to be that invested in what's going on. And like honestly, I hope this isn't mean to say, but it kind of makes sense to me that there's not much of a crowd because the clothes being shown here are are so weird looking that I don't really know who the audience for them is outside of those exact people who are already there. Like, like they kind of look like if Kmart had an avant-garde section. On, honestly, I think that Carrie said it best when she said this. Our makeup is black eyes, uh, rosy cheeks, almost like a hooker from back in, you know, old hooker times, I guess. Of course, since this is top model, there's going to be a twist, and that's where that clue from the Tyra mail comes into play, because surprisingly, it did not turn out to mean gravy train in Latin. You, as models, have to be ready for anything. These are giant Madagascar hissing cockroaches. It was, it was actually the, the Latin name for the Madagascar hissing cockroach, and, and each of the girls will be wearing one of those as they walk down the runway. Everyone is upset by the, by the challenge, except for Jade, who, who seems pretty happy about it. Like, like she kind of, she kind of reacts to the news like she's a kid at a birthday party watching a magician. Everybody's going to have to wear one of these. <gasps> and like, maybe I'm just not that scared of bugs, but the challenge does not seem that bad to me. Like. Like walking around with a single cockroach on the outside of your clothes doesn't seem like it would be that much harder than, than if it had just been a straightforward runway challenge. Like honestly, based on that opening scene and my own personal experience with Dirty Homes in Los Angeles, the girls have probably already had to deal with their fair share of cockroaches in the competition. And my guess is that those roaches were probably worse because 
because they weren't attached to pretty gold chains. Like honestly, as far as I'm concerned, the only person who should be complaining in this challenge is whatever poor PA had to wake up at 5 a.m. to bejewel a bunch of cockroaches and then put them inside of a ceramic goblet. Even if I was afraid of cockroaches, I don't think I would take it to the extreme that Gina does here because she freaks out so bad that she has to be physically pushed on stage by the designer. Like, like she's clearly in a lot of distress here and well, well it's, it's actually pretty fun to watch. Get him on front, get him on the front. I'm freaked out. I can't handle it and I'm really thinking maybe I just shouldn't do this. Okay, ready? Princess, you gotta get it together. You're holding up the show. Get it together, go! To her credit though, she does manage to put on her game face pretty seamlessly once she's actually on stage in a moment that I love and, and I promise you I did not edit in any way. Out. It probably did not help the situation that Jade saw that she was afraid of the cockroaches and, and actively tried to rile her up earlier. Kiss it, come on. Kiss it, kiss it. No, it's kiss okay. It. Yeah. The show kind of plays that like Jade is being a bully to Gina because, well, she probably is. They've been ramping up the drama between the two of them a lot for the last few episodes and it kind of reaches a breaking point next week. So it makes sense that they would highlight that little moment, but but I honestly don't even know if Jade was actually being malicious there. Like, I think there's honestly just a chance that Jade just likes cockroaches a lot. Like, like, like look again at how she reacts to, to, to being told that she would be wearing one for the runway show. And of course, she even gives one of the roaches a kiss on the lips, which is where we get the title of the episode. Oh, she kissed it. They loved it, dude. They loved it. This gave a little pet. And whether or not it's because she has some weird obsession with cockroaches, Jade does seem like she's completely in her element here. Like, honestly, I think my favorite part of the episode might just be when she's off in her own world, completely feeling herself, and the designer is just, like, kind of in her orbit, not really sure how to respond to it. My look is very eccentric. Very strong, so. Hey, you know what? So is mine. And honestly, she's right to feel herself because she rocks this challenge. Like, like if I ever found myself at a poorly attended runway show where where models were forced to wear bejeweled cockroaches, this is exactly what I would want to see there. She wins the challenge and it is well deserved. And like, maybe she is a bully sometimes, but the more I watch the show, the more I love Jade. And then like, before I move on, I do want to just take a moment to highlight the way that they styled Sarah because it is just insane. And, and I haven't made fun of Sarah yet this episode, which, which, which is not like me at all. After the challenge, we jump to the photo shoot, which honestly is not my favorite. Like, it has its moments, but it kind of just feels like they had two different ideas of what to do and they kind of just mashed them together in a way that, that didn't super make sense to me. The premise is that the girls are supposed to pose while they're falling and, and, and they are going to do it while also portraying a famous fairy tale character for, for, for some reason. You can tell that not a lot of thought was put into this shoot based solely on the fact that the forest background they use looks kind of like something you'd stand in front of on your school picture day. Like, like I think what may have happened was that they blew their entire budget for this week on, on cockroach drools and, and so they just kind of had to like scramble to throw something together. That said though, it does feature one of my favorite things that happens in top model photo shoots sometimes, which is when they have a concept which requires each girl get assigned a different part to play and then they clearly realize halfway through that the idea that they came up with didn't come with enough good parts to give each of the girls. Like they start out with some standards. Veranda, we're gonna make you Rapunzel. Danielle, we're gonna have the first black snow white. What? <laughs> yeah. Gina, 
You're gonna be Sleeping Beauty. And then they just slowly start reaching. We're gonna make you a sexy big bad wolf, Molly Sue. You're gonna be little boy blue. Have you ever heard of the Emperor's New Clothes? Yeah. But we're gonna play it out, make it kind of cute. My favorite instance of this though is Nena, who is given the princess from the Princess and the Frog, which was clearly them not even trying at all. Have you heard of the Princess and the Frog? Mm -hmm. But you're basically the princess. I think they must have just had the dress and been like, okay, this looks like a princess. Well, what's another fairy tale with a princess? You have five seconds. They didn't even give her a frog to hold. Clear, clearly no effort went into it. As far as the actual photos are concerned, I think that the best are Danielle and Jade. Danielle's is beautiful, and I feel like it's the only one where it looks like something you might actually see in a fashion magazine as opposed to just the product of what might happen if a bunch of hot friends did, did shrooms together and broke into the dressing room of their high school theater department. Jade's, meanwhile, looks the coolest in my opinion, but I don't know how much of that is due to her modeling ability so much as the fact that she's just generally very striking and her costuming complemented her look really well. Like, I feel like even though she's playing Little Red Riding Hood, you can't really look at her without thinking Big Bad Wolf. So the juxtaposition makes for a really cool shot. Like, like if someone were to base an anime on this picture, I'd probably watch it. Also, just a little aside, but I cannot for the life of me understand the mechanics of what's going on with her feet here. And believe me when I tell you that I have stared at this picture for hours trying to. With all that said though, even though Jade and Danielle's photos were definitely the best, I'd still say that my favorite is probably Gina's and not because it was good by any stretch of the imagination, but rather because the way it's styled and the way she's posing, it kind of makes it look like she's the most annoying rich girl in your high school who was like, Oh, I have an idea for how I'm going to stand out in my yearbook. Mummy, book me the studio, won't you? As usual, I wanted to do my best to recreate the photo shoot on my own, but since I don't have any princess dresses that fit, it, it was kind of hard for me to pull off. Fortunately, what I did have was a Robin costume from, from Batman and Robin, so I figured that that would do just as well because... As everyone is always saying, superheroes are just modern day fairy tales. Uh, also, also, by the way, just to give you a little taste at, at what self-esteem is like in my household, know that we do not have a Batman costume. Uh, oh, only Robin. In any case, I now have a massive bruise on my side from, from falling onto a bunch of couch cushions and and my own mortality has never felt more palpable than, than it does right now. After the photo shoot, it's judging time, and this week we get our first judging challenge, which are some of the best parts of ANTM. And, and by best there, I mean, I mean that they're over the top and, and kind of cruel, but fun to watch in a morbidly fascinating kind of way. This week's challenge is one of the more infamous moments in top model history, which is saying something. And, and truth told, if you've ever gotten high and, and put on a Vine compilation with your friends, then you've probably already seen clips from it. it, it if you haven't done that, then, then what's wrong with you? That's, it's, it's, you should try it. It's really fun. If you're unfamiliar, the moment I'm referring to is this. which is regrettable, but somehow not even the most unfortunate thing to happen during this judging panel. That prize, of course, goes to this shot we get of Jade doing the best to make the most of the horrible makeover they forced on her by attempting a faux hawk, only to have it end up as a bit of a, of a, of a Krusty the Clown looking, looking situation, which, which she's kind of pulling off, but, but still the stylist who did that to her should have their license revoked. If, if stylists have licenses. 
Oh, and also Danielle is injured to the point where she has to walk on crutches by the end of the episode, which, which, which is also which is also pretty bad. But 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 arguably not as bad as the faux hawk. The judging challenge is that the girls are made to walk in these really high pumps, which seems like it would be extremely difficult. Although, that said, maybe I'm not one to judge. Because honestly, just walking the length of the runway would be extremely difficult for me. The challenge is inspired by a time that Tyra walked in a similar pair of shoes in a Vivian Westwood fashion show and, and fell down. Vivian Westwood is known for having fashion shows that are kind of Victorian inspired. And a lot of the time she has models wear shoes that are very uncomfortable and very high. They're so uncomfortable that one of the most famous models in the entire world wore them and fell to her booty on the runway in these shoes. And watching her say that made me realize that a lot of this show is kind of just Tyra making the contestants do stuff that she herself did before and still kind of has a chip on her shoulder about, which honestly kind of informs some of the more problematic elements of, of America's Next Top Model. Having the girls walk in extremely high heels is obviously not the most problematic idea that a show who, not two seasons earlier, had the contestants pose as other races to make Got Milk ads has, has ever had. But that said, this challenge is still kind of messed up for the sole reason that it's very clear that the ultimate goal was to watch some of the girls trip and fall. Obviously, the goal of the producers is to create something entertaining, and there is nothing entertaining about this challenge when everything goes off without a hitch. The challenge very clearly banks on the fact that a few of the girls might stumble and fall in order to be interesting. That coupled with the fact that Tyra mentions falling while introducing the challenge and the fact that the photo shoots were literally just the girls posing while falling makes me feel fairly justified in saying that all the tripping and falling that happens and all the subsequent injuries were, were pretty much on purpose. With that in mind, watching this challenge feels, feels less like watching a challenge and, and more like a dystopian ritual in which a bunch of young girls risk their lives for the entertainment of a council of elders. Like I said earlier, Danielle falls. Ow, ow, ow. <laughs> and after she does, we get a rare glimpse at the backstage of judging as the medics tend to her wound. I feel my pinky toe like came completely out and twisted. You can't feel any displacement or anything. You probably yeah. just strain. Yeah, strain it. Yeah. It's a weird tonal shift that I think they only included so they would have video evidence of a doctor saying that her injuries weren't that bad, so so people didn't get angry when she came hobbling back into the, the judging panel on crutches. Aside from that, the only other interesting thing that happens in judging is that Carrie breaks down crying when it's her turn to be judged, and, and when I say it's interesting, it's less because of the actual crying and more because of how the judges kind of scramble to try and react to, to human emotions. All right, Terry, so you had a photo. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> What's wrong, Carrie? Like, I think that Tyra kind of already knows that Carrie is going to get eliminated, so it kind of seems like she's torn between wanting to console her and, and not wanting to get her hopes up, so she just kind of, like, fakes a smile and and waits for the moment to pass, you know? I just wanted to do well, and I, <laughs> it was a mess. <laughs> and I thought it was a mess. <laughs> okay, well, hopefully your picture's good. Her reaction is not nearly as bad as Nigel's, though, because you can tell by his tone of voice that he is genuinely trying to be kind and sympathetic towards Carrie, but the actual words he says are... Well, they're probably not what Carrie wanted to hear, at this particular moment in time. I think just work out and get yourself toned up a little bit. Nothing drastic, just tone it up and I think it'll really help you. 
I I'm definitely going to hell for watching this show, aren't I? Ultimately, the bottom two are Carrie and Gina, and like I already said, Carrie goes home. And I honestly kind of think that this is one of the more controversial eliminations of the season for the reason that it it's kind of bullcrap. Like, I honestly think that the only reason that Gina got to stay is because she was feuding with Jade and the producers wanted to see where that was going, while Carrie didn't really have a storyline to speak of, and, and so that made her much more easily expendable. And, like, I guess it's not that big a deal in the grand scheme of things because we're all going to die one day anyway, but it does feel weird that Carrie would be the one who goes home given the lesson that the show seemed to be trying to pitch this week. And, and, and if you're wondering what that lesson is exactly, then I think it can be best summed up by Danielle. It hurts, but you know, the best fall down sometimes as long as you get back up. There's a solid chance that the show only included that clip because their legal team made them in case Danielle ever decided to lawyer up. But between all the talk of falling and, and the literal falls that occur, the, the show seems to be pushing the idea that, that sometimes in life you will fall and it's important to you know, learn from those falls and, and get back up and all that fun stuff that you've heard a million times before in your life. And if that's the case, then it's just kind of weird because I feel like Carrie didn't ever really fall. I mean, literally, she fell lots of times. But if I didn't know anything about what was going to happen going into this episode, I would not have guessed that she was going to be the one who got eliminated. Like. Her pictures were all really good, and aside from her inability to walk in the single worst pair of shoes ever created, she was doing pretty solidly in the competition. And granted, I'm not a working model, but my guess is if you were ranking bigger no-nos in the industry, tripping on the runway wouldn't place nearly as high as screaming at the top of your lungs backstage and, and refusing to walk like Gina did. Like, clearly if this was a meritocracy, then Gina would absolutely be the one who was going home. But, but of course, Top Model is, is really more of, of like a tyragarchy trademark. Like I already said, the only reason why they would keep Gina over Carrie is because she was doing so poorly in the competition that Jade decided to pick on her and that made for much better television. The ultimate goal of the people making this show is to get a good storyline out of the contestants, and, and those storylines are made up of the highs and the lows. Someone like Carrie who's just doing alright all the way through isn't really adding much to the show, and, 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 and so it makes sense that they would, they would send her home. That said, if you've watched my other Top Model videos, you're probably screaming at your computer something along the lines of, fuck Carrie. Maybe this lesson of Getting back up when you fall doesn't apply to her, but at least it applies to you. After all, now is the time in my video when I pivot away from talking about the show and start talking about myself in a way that borders on oversharing and will probably alienate me from ever attracting any larger audience. And based on that whole whiny spiel I gave at the beginning of this video, it would make sense that I would go that route, right? Like. I've been having a hard time making new videos for this series, so I need to learn how to pick myself up after I've fallen and just keep on walking. And, and part of me does want to go with that because then I could just be done with this video. But the truth is that, just like Carrie, I don't really think that I've fallen either. The fact of the matter is my journey making this show is going just fine right now. Like, I'm not getting a lot of views at this point, but that's to be expected since I'm just starting out, and at the very least, the people who are watching it seem to be enjoying it. The videos I'm making are a little bit janky, to be sure, but I'm learning, and I like to think that the quality is getting a little better with every new episode that I put out. If you were to tell me four months ago that this is where I would be at this point, I'd be like, yeah. That makes sense, because the fact of the matter is, I'm doing fine. Just fine.
But honestly, fine can kind of suck sometimes. Don't get me wrong, I feel like a massive tool for saying that, but, but it's true. In the grand scheme of things, I guess I'm more of a Gina than a Danielle. I mean, I don't know what you've been through in your life, but... Not much. But the truth is that I've fallen enough in my life that while I don't recommend it, I will say that it's not without its benefits. Every time I feel like I've fallen hard in my life, it's, it's sucked. Like, like really, really sucked. But there's also been something kind of easy about it too. Like, granted, it's a soul-crushing, awful, incredibly hard sort of easy, but yeah, that said, there are aspects about it that are kind of easier. This show is far from the first time I've heard people extol the values of learning to pick yourself up when you fall, but part of me isn't sure why that's a lesson that lots and lots of people talk about because I feel like once you've found yourself in a position that you're going to need that lesson, you're probably going to learn it on your own anyway. When you really fall in life, you kind of have no choice but to learn how to pick yourself back up and figure out a new path for yourself because your old path isn't really an option anymore. That's kind of the whole point. Who knows, you might even learn a lesson and grow from the experience so that maybe you won't fall as hard in the same way next time. And Truth be told, that can be very useful. Which, like, that's not to say that I'm ever pro-falling. Like, I feel like a lot of people, top model very much included, like to romanticize struggle in a way that I don't ever want to do because, I don't know, I don't care how many lessons you learn from it. If it was up to me, nobody would ever suffer. That said, though, that's not how life works. And when you do inevitably fall, then you will probably grow from the experience. Like, it might be a long, hard process, but you will learn a lesson from it and you will probably carry that lesson with you for the rest of your life. And this is all to say that it's kind of weird to me how people talk about this kind of stuff because as far as I'm concerned, telling someone that they need to learn how to pick themselves back up when they fall is kind of like telling someone that they need to learn how to ask for the Heimlich maneuver if they're choking. Like, it's good advice but it's not particularly deep, it's, it's just kind of what you do in that situation. Although that said, it makes sense that people would spend a lot of time thinking about what to do when you're at your lowest because the lows might suck, but in the grand scheme of your life, they're interesting at the very least. Like I already said, stories are made up of the highs and the lows. Top model producers know it and my guess is that you know it on some level too. What I feel like people don't talk enough about is all the in-between stuff in life, you know? The stuff that's not quite a low and isn't quite a high yet. And even though that's most of life, I get why it would get short shrift because just like Carrie, there's really no storyline there. I think people often confuse fine with easy and like, yeah, in the grand scheme of things, I guess that's true for the most part, but there's also a lot of complexity there. It's a lot like walking on a runway, you know? You don't think that there's much to it until you're actually in the moment and you realize that there's a lot more that you have to think about. It's not as soul crushing as the stuff you go through when you fall, but the in-between times can be long and they can be boring and more than anything, they can be really, really scary sometimes. If you rewatch that judging challenge, the parts where the girls fall were upsetting to be sure but honestly the most intense part of the sequence was the part where everyone is holding their breath not knowing if the girls were going to fall and stressing about what might happen if they do your time slow down And honestly, that's kind of how I feel these days. Like, like I'm precariously balanced on some impossibly high shoes, wobbling my way towards where I want to go and not really sure if I'm gonna fall before I get there. And like, I promise to try and make it so that this series doesn't always devolve into some weird meta commentary on me trying to make this series, but I'm also trying to make it as honest to my life as I can. And these videos are a pretty big part of my life right now and 
Right now, making them has started to feel like a slog. Like I said, I'm past the point where it feels exciting and new, and not quite at the point where it feels second nature. I'm, I'm getting better at making them, but I'm still not great. And while I'm extremely grateful to have the audience that I do, I, I don't yet have the kind of audience where, where this sort of thing would be sustainable. And I, I don't know if I ever will. And like, believe me, I hope it doesn't seem like I'm complaining because I know how awful and annoying that sounds. Like, like I fully expect to look back at this video one day in the future and look at myself and say like, wow, what a whiny little bitch. I hate that dude. But that said, if you are saying that, then screw you, future me, because it's a lot easier to think this stuff is unfounded and silly when you already know how it turns out. When you're actually in the thick of it and it can still go any way, it can really wear on you. And, and as much as you want to get to your highest high on the horizon, more than anything, you just want to know where the fuck it is that you're going. If I had to guess at why pick yourself up when you fall is such ubiquitous advice, it's probably to tell people to not give up. But if that's the case, then it feels like a really weird way of putting it. Like, I don't think that reacting negatively to being knocked down is giving up. I think that's just more being human. Trying to paint that as some sort of moral failing is weird and honestly, maybe even a little bit cruel to me. Giving up to me happens more in the times when you're so far in the middle that you can't see the end and you have no idea what's going to happen. And so rather than trucking along and hoping for the best, you make your own ending just so that you have one in sight. Giving up to me is the times when the boredom or the long slog or the genuine stress that comes from being just fine gets too much to bear. And so you make yourself fall because there can be something easier about that. And at least then you have your answer. You don't have to do much searching through the graveyard of abandoned projects that is my YouTube channel to realize that this is something that I've done a lot in my life. And while I don't necessarily fault my past self for feeling that way in the moment, I gotta tell you, there's still a lot of times when I wonder if I would have eventually reached that high that I was chasing. I still have a lot of the uncertainty that was driving me insane. I'm just, just not on that path anymore. And like, I'm not going to give up on this one. I'm, I'm going to finish it if it kills me. Although that said, to maybe bust up some of the boredom and stress that comes from being in that in-between phase, I'm probably going to do a top model video every other video instead of all at once now, because I think that that will help. Although that said, I'm sure it won't take me long until I become a whiny bitch about doing those videos as well. In any case, I guess this is all to say that learning to pick yourself up when you fall is important, but maybe the more important lesson here is learning to just keep putting one foot in front of the other over and over again, no matter what the situation, and being able to trust that you'll eventually get to where you're supposed to go. Just, you know, be sure to be aware of your arm as you do it. Is your left arm attached to your body? Okay. Oh, and please like and subscribe.